may seem like a belated Christmas message, but that's what it is. <laughs> and it kind of moves into the new year too, amen? Because we're gonna, I don't know what it is about this year, but it seems to be caught in between Sundays, you know, where Christmas really wasn't on Sunday. And I don't, I, when's New Year's this year? Wednesday. Wednesday. So we're kind of caught in the middle. So I guess this message kind of deals with both of those. Uh, I've entitled this morning's sermon, God's Gift to You, God's Gift to You. I'm in Luke chapter 2, verse 1 through 20. Please stand for the reading of the word. Luke 2, verse 1 through 20, New American Standard Bible. Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to re register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. And she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. In the same region there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. And when they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. And all heard it wondered at the things which were told to them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. Verse 20. The shepherds went back glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as been told to them. Please be seated. I really enjoyed uh, Wayne's sermon last Sunday. I got to tell you that before we get started. And the reason is because all the participation that was going on in church, maybe more so for me, but I really liked it. But uh, I hope you did too. It was, it was good and I, I appreciate him stepping in last Sunday. I would ask you this this morning. What's the best gift you ever received? Salvation. 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 Jesus. How true it is to know this truth. It's more blessed to give than to receive. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Look at Acts 20, verse 32 through 35. The scripture reads, And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or clothes. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my own needs and to the men who were with me. In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, that he himself said, what? It is more blessed to give than to receive. I went looking for that in the scripture, and guess what I couldn't find? I couldn't find this quote anywhere in the New Testament Bible other than this moment here. So it's another one of those things that was spoken by the Lord that someone remembered and then shared with us. Isn't that amazing? We see clearly in the advent of Christ Jesus our Lord that God gives to us. Would you agree with that? God gives to us. It's more blessed to give than to receive. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Do you know that? Everything that he gives to us, look, look, look at this. For 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. Simon Peter, a bondservant, apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received the faith of the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God 
and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and to godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now how did this all come about? How did you, how were you able to obtain this divine power and glory? How, how did you get a hold of it? Well, apart from Christ coming, you, you don't. Apart from the advent, apart from Jesus Christ coming upon this earth and being born, even that was an act of faith, you know. It took an act of faith of who? Mary. She had to believe what the angel said, and she believed. She said, let it be unto me as you have spoken. And then she conceived the Lord. But apart from the Lord coming, you have no ability to partake in the divine nature of God. You have no ability, no ability as a Christian to overcome the things that you're dealing with in life. God gives. He gives, a, he gives us everything we need for life and for godliness. You see that, right? You understand that. That God gives of himself to us out of his divine power. Out of his divine power, he gives you power. Out of his glory, he gives you glory. And out of his goodness, he gives you goodness and the ability to be good. We hear the account of God's giving in the birth of Jesus in Luke's gospel. Jesus is God's gift to man. Do you believe that? That's the gift. The ultimate gift that God could give to you was what? His own son. That's what he gave to you. Jesus, the Christ of God. Jesus, the son of God is given to us out of God's goodness. He gave him to us out of his goodness, wrapped up in his holiness and glory, filled with the life and power of God himself. Why? Why did he do this? All these are intricate to the character and nature of God. And Christ Jesus, his son, in order to enable you to overcome death and to attain to the resurrection of the dead. You believe that? All, that, all, this, all this whole reason why Jesus came is so that you can live forever and attain to the resurrection of the dead and live forever. That's why he did this. To rescue you from death. Just as we sang a few minutes ago. To rescue us from the power of Satan and death. And to bring you to life. In every aspect, Jesus is the gift of God. The gift of God is the real gift that keeps on giving. You like that little quote, right? The gift that keeps on giving. They usually talk about that with the jelly club of the month, right? It's the gift that keeps on giving. They keep giving you jelly. Jesus is the real gift that keeps on giving. Even more so, he is the gift that keeps giving and then causes you to do the same. It's an amazing gift that God has given to us because Christ Jesus comes into you and he gives to you such wonderful things. Doesn't he? What does he give to you, church? What does he give it to you? Come on, name some stuff. Everything. Everything. But come on, name it. Life. life. So he gives you life, and then you're able, it enables you to impart life. Agreed? The word. God gives you the word. He puts the word inside of your heart so that you can do what with it? Keep it and hide it and never let it out. No? Let it, so he gives you the word so that you can what? Share the word. What else does he give you? Oh, he gives you forgiveness. So I get forgiveness, and, but then I don't give it to nobody else. No, we already had that conversation this morning, right? He gives us permission to love everybody. He does. He gives you the ability to love just like he loves. And I promise you this, that God loves who? Everyone. Even if they reject it. We don't have to hate the sinner. We don't. You don't have to hate them. And more so, you should feel sorry for them because they don't understand what you understand. They don't know what you... What is it like? You can put it in an expression and tell me exactly what it's like to come into that full understanding of what forgiveness is and the peace of God that comes in. Explain that to me in words. It's beyond you. Oh, how I wish I had some Ferrer Rochers right now. I really do. You know, that's one of my favorite stories. You try to, t you, if you've never had a Ferrero Rocher chocolate, 
And yet, if I was to take, ask five of you, how many of you guys have had one? Anybody would raise their hand? Any, you've had one? Who has never had one, a Ferrero Rocher? Anybody here? we got one guy who's never had a Ferrero Rocher. Okay, all you guys try to explain to him what that tastes like. Linda said I've had some, so don't. Not you. Yes, Mar Carson has never had one. Explain it to him. Tell him what it's like. What does a Ferrero Rocher taste like? Chocolate. Oh, cranberry crunchies. Oh, the best ones. It's like, yes. Hazelnuts all wrapped up in love and joy. Huh? They are, man. And then it's just really soft inside. So it's crunchy on the outside, but then soft on the inside. And you pop that thing in your mouth, and it just melts away. But guess what? He can't do. He can't taste it right now. And I, if I had one right now, I'd throw it to him and then pop it and say, hey, pop that in your mouth and tell me what that tastes like. And then, I don't know about you. Maybe you don't like those, but they, it's like my favorite chocolate. It's the best chocolate known to man. That's the same way with Jesus Christ. It's the same way with trying to explain to somebody the peace of God that you have, the forgiveness that you've received, this love that you're talking about, this forgiveness that you've experienced in your life. And you try to express that to someone, but until they unwrap the gift of God and experience it for themselves, they'll never know what it really what tastes like. You'll never know what it really tastes like. The gift of God is the real gift that keeps on giving to you. Why? Because of the things that it imparts to you. Jesus continues to impart things to you. How do you know this? Because I'm still learning. I'm still, I'm still unwrapping this gift. I'm still unwrapping this gift as it unwraps me. It makes me whole. Take a moment and make an inventory of all that God has given to you. The very life you experience, the food and drink you enjoy, the work of your hands, the very earth that you live upon, all that is in it, all that is of it. Where did it come from? It all came from God. And God gave it to who? He gave it to you. He gave it to me. There's nothing that you have that did not or does not originate in God. Nothing. Your being, your soul, all that you see, all that you hear, all that you touch and taste and feel, both physically and spiritually, is a product of God giving to you. Nothing God has given to you is intended for corruption and evil. And I want to emphasize that. Because what man has done with what God has given to him is something completely different. Because what God has given to you was always intended for good. And it was never intended for any form of evil. But man has corrupted it through his flesh. And for, for the desire of other things. Man has corrupted it, but in God's sight, it's still what? Holy and good. Why? Because he spoke into existence. But what you do with it is something completely different. Everything that God has given to you is intended for good. Even you, I would say. What you choose to do with it, and what God has given to you, that's a whole other story, isn't it? But not today. I don't want to talk about that today. I don't want to talk about what you've chosen to do with it. It's a truly an amazing thing. All that God gives still produces and reproduces after itself and after its own kind. All God does still lives and gives. I'm going to put that on a card. <laughs> Listen to that. All God does still lives and gives. Even you. You're still alive, aren't you? Huh? Are you still giving? Yeah, he's still alive and working you, right? He's still moving in you. It's an awesome thing. Just step back and take a hard look at this past year. Maybe you'll do that tonight. You lay on your bed before you fall asleep tonight. Take a hard look at this last year. What has all that God has given to you produced? What's it produced in you? What's it produced in others? Has it had any form of effect this year in life and what you've given, what you've done with what God has given to you? What has the gift yielded in this year of life, this year of life that he's also given to you? He gave you another year of life. You're still here, aren't you? I would encourage you tonight to take inventory, to 
take a hard look and see all that God has done for you and what he's given to you. Even through the pain and the sorrow? Yes, Chuck. Absolutely. He's still giving it to you, hasn't he? Julie and I, we, we lost Stuart this, this last couple of weeks. We lost him. But I've been sitting back and thinking and taking inventory and thinking of the good. Trying to think of the good. And the value that he had in my life. The impact that he had in my life. Hopefully the impact I had in his life. And the impact each one of you that knew him had in his life. I guarantee you did. You know why I know? Because he spoke of you often. He loved you. Why, why do you think he loved you? I never heard him talk about other churches before. Did you, Julia? I never heard, I, I promise you, I never heard him talk about any experience. All the time that he was living in Alabama, when he was up in, uh, uh, in, in Georgia, I never heard him refer to any other church or any of the people. You know who he spoke of? You. So why do you, why do you think that is? Why, did, why do you think he cared about you? I'll tell you why. It's because of what you sowed in his life. Say it again. He, he, he was felt accepted, but he, the love that you sowed in his life has worked. It worked. And it caused him to love. Think about it. The love of God reproduces after itself. Love. You sowed to the spirit and not to the flesh. Not to the flesh. How precious it is to be the giver. The giver takes the time to evaluate the need or needs of those whom the giver shall give to. The giver takes the time and effort to ensure the perfect gift will supply some form of need or want that you may have. The giver wraps it up and puts your name on it. Then they wait in anticipation of watching you open it up and unwrap it. They long for you to be joyful and they see the expression from your heart to your face when you finally realize what you have received is exactly what you were looking for. That is the joy of the giver. The joy of the giver, to sit back and watch you finally get what you really want and what you really need. You know whose joy that is? The Lord's. That's the Lord's joy. Is for you to finally unwrap it. What are you talking about, church? Salvation. Coming to Christ, absolutely. Experiencing the forgiveness you were talking about. Experiencing the love. Experiencing the effect of what real peace brings into your life. And to see you wrap that up and unwrap it, right? And for it to be unwrapped inside of you because now all of a sudden you get to experience God's peace and then you bring that peace to other people's lives. You get to experience God's love and you get to bring that love to other people. And all of a sudden it's having its effect. And you think that doesn't bring joy to the Lord's heart? And a smile upon his face? And it should bring one upon yours? <laughs> I'm telling you what. The joy of being the giver where you, you are the giver. Because that's exactly who your Lord is. He's the giver. God does all that for you. He gave you a son. He gave you his own spirit. It is the perfect gift for you and anyone else who dares to receive it. And I emphasize that, who dares to receive it. We should all hope, as God does, to finally realize what we have gotten. In all honesty, God's gift to us is exactly what every soul is longing for. God's gift meets every need in the singular remedy medicine of Jesus Christ. A singular medicine to every man, woman, and child is given to meet every and any need that you may have. I'm, I believe that with all my heart. You say, well, that, I haven't realized that yet, but you're still growing, aren't you? I haven't fully arrived yet, have you? Huh? None of us? But the medicine's working. How do you know, Chuck? He's changing my heart. He's changing my mind. He's changing my life. He's changing your life. He's bringing you into a closer relationship with himself. He's bringing you into a more compatible relationship with the spirit and the things of the kingdom of heaven. And oh, by the way, as you're doing this, you're affecting the world around you. You are. You're affecting the world around you by the things you say, by the things you do as a product of that love and what you've experienced in Christ. The, God, the gift that God's given to you. 
He heals every aspect of life. Listen, he heals every aspect of life and restores it to what it was supposed to be and to return to God's original plan and his design. That's his intention for you, is to bring you back to what you're really supposed to be. That's God's gift to you as well. How marvelous this gift seems to be to me, because I hope, like each of you, that we're still in the process of unwrapping it, unwrapping the gift that he's given to us, as he continues to reveal the depths of Christ and the things of him and his kingdom to us, as he continues to open your heart and mind to the things of himself. Look at Acts 6, 1 through 19. I'm sorry, Acts 26, verse 1 through 19. Flipping back to Paul. Agrippa said to Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. We've got to take a backdrop on this for a moment. Because it wasn't too far removed, and we'll come up with that scripture before, that there was a portion of prayer and a portion of time that Paul said that all I know is I'm bound to go to Jerusalem. And now he's, he's arrived, and they've imprisoned him. And they brought him before who? Agrippa and Felix. And Agrippa said to Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. And then Paul stretched out his hand and proceeded to make his defense. In regard to all these things of which I am accused by the Jews, I consider myself fortunate. What? He's in prison. He's in chains. And he considers himself what? Fortunate. Fortunate. I consider myself fortunate, King Agrippa, that I'm about to make my defense before you today, especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions among the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently, so that all the Jews know my manner of life, from my youth up, which from the beginning was spent along, among my own nation and at Jerusalem. What's he referring back to? His former life. His for I say that again. His former life. His former life. This is who he used to be. Since they have known about me for a long time, if they are willing to testify that I lived as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect of our religion, and now I'm standing trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers, the promise to which our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly serve God day and night. And for this hope, O King, I am being accused by the Jews. Why is it considered incredible among you people if God does raise the dead? It's all about what? The resurrection of the dead. Verse 9. So then I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile. Listen to this. I thought myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prison having received authority from the chief priests, but also, when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. I want to stop here for a moment. Again, we're talking about previous life of Paul, right? Listen to this. I wonder today, what, what, before you became a Christian, what were you doing against the name of Jesus? Oh, you must have done many things against the name of Jesus. I know I did. And, and I gave myself wholly over to those things. I took them to levels my father never did. I promise you. Paul did the same thing. He took, he took his desire and what he wanted to do. Whose authority was he working under? The chief priest. Yeah, flip it in your mind now. Who's he working for now? He's working for Jesus now. Whose authority is he working under now? Oh, life has changed for him. But he still refers to his past life. I think it's one of the things that we fail to do as Christians, you know, because we make ourselves out to be so holy and righteous like we got all this glory right, and we forget to tell people about the truth of who we used to be. Paul doesn't do this. Paul doesn't do this. How do you know, Chuck? Well, listen to the rest of the story. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. And as I punished them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme. And being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. While so engaged as I was journeying to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven. 
brighter than the sun, shining all around me, and those who were journeying with me. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? Who, who got a taste of that? Well, the shepherds. Remember the shepherds? They saw, they saw this glory also. They saw it. Verse 14. And we all had fallen to the ground. I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose, I have, I have appeared to you to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things which I will appear to you or reveal to you, some of your, some of your Bibles render it, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so they might turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, and that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. So, King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision. And that's where Paul's standing right now. The gift of God to Paul, to Paul has this pr profound effect, not only upon Paul, but to everyone whom Paul comes in contact with. What was your way of life prior to the gift of Christ in you? What was your way of life? You were doing everything contrary to the name of Jesus? I would agree with that. What would those who knew you say about you in regards of those days? What would people say? What would they think of you? What would they say about you? I would be afraid if half of the people I knew came in here and told you the things I did. I've experienced that before. But we have this tendency not to share the truth. Without, without the past in your life, saint, you wouldn't be a saint. Without your reflection on that, to see what you were and what you've come to and the change, that's the important part. That's the gift of God to you, the change that he brings in your life, the change that he brings in your life. I find it amazing when you look at this portion of Scripture how the change has affected Paul. At one point, he's so willing to go anywhere and anywhere to do anything that he could do to destroy Christians and to put to death the name of who? Jesus. And now he's willing to stand before kings and anybody else in the entire court system and proclaim what? The name of Christ. And to let them know why. Why? What's the, what's the objective? To turn you from the power of Satan to what? To life. To righteousness to holiness, to salvation, forgiveness, and all those things that God gives to us. Would you attest to the fact today, saint, that you were contrary to the name of Jesus? Would you say that? Yes. I am. I was. With what exactly were you occupied with and in pursuit of prior to Jesus? What were you in pursuit of? Paul told, tells you exactly what he was doing, killing people. That's what he was doing. Destroying the body of Christ. How awesome it would be if everyone had the experience of Paul and were directly confronted with the gift of God. <laughs> In such a personal way, and I mean that most emphatically, forced to drop to your knees and to hear the voice of the Lord speak to you personally. You know what he would say to you? After you acknowledged him, Lord, who are you? And he would tell you, and you know what he would do to you? He would say, now stand up. Stand up. I've appointed you for a reason and a purpose. He would cause you to stand and enable you to minister and to witness to what you have seen and all that he will reveal to you. Continue to open God's gift, I would say to you today. Allow him to open you up to all that is of him. Nothing, nothing has changed God's gift to you keeps on giving to those he has changed. Listen to this. For how long? He has. He's changed you forever. He's changed you forever. Look at Acts 20, 18 through 24, which is the rest of the story. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia how I was with you the whole time. 
serving the Lord with all humility, with tears and with trials, which came upon me through the plot of the Jews. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly from house to house. Solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, bound by the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. But now you do know what happened, right? Now you know what happened when he went there. Verse 23 says, Except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly to the gospel of the grace of God. That's who you are. That's who you are. That's what your life is about. That's why God has called you. That's why he's brought you into this perfect salvation, to know his peace, to know his love, to know the gift of God. The story that we read this morning about Jesus Christ coming, the announcement why? Because God's pleased with you. Can you tell yourself that? I mean that. Can you tell yourself that? The angel said so. He's pleased with me. How is this possible? Oh, because you believe. Because you believe this message. And you've returned back to him. He's pleased with you. He's pleased with you. Tell yourself that. He's pleased with you. It's an awesome thing to walk in that form of acceptance, of approval. The, not approval of man. How could Paul stand before such men as kings and tell them this gospel message? Is he looking for their approval? The answer is no. He's already walking in what? The approval of God. He's, he's operating under a new authority. He's operating under a new direction. He's operating no longer in destroying life, but to impart life as much as people will listen to him, even if he catches a brick in the head now and then. They drag him out to the end of the street because they think he's dead, and God raises him back up, and he goes, where does he go? Right back into the city. And they're like, you're crazy, Paul. You've lost your mind. No, I haven't. I've, I've still got work to do. I'm not done yet. Otherwise, I would not be here anymore. You still have work to do. Why? Why? Because of God's gift to you. God's gift to you. Think about that. God's gift to you. You're approved. You're approved. Take his message forward, amen? Take his message forward. Take Jesus forward. Take it forward. Any thoughts? Any other scriptures? So you see how that correlates, right? The Christmas story. But you've got a whole brand new year coming, don't you? You're going to take account of this last year? Take account of this coming year and think. Think, what kind of effect is the Lord going to have upon you to affect the world around you? That's God's gift to you. I know, by the way, I look at each one of you and I say, what an awesome gift that God has given to me. And I hope you do the same for each other. What are you talking about? You. Each of you. Thank you for you. Thank you. Thank you for you. Any other thoughts? Any other scriptures? Go ahead, man. I have often been concerned with the same, peace on earth, peace on earth, peace on earth. And I thought, no, God didn't come to bring, or Jesus didn't come to bring peace. He came to split, you know, how that goes. And then just this time I saw it where it said, peace among men with whom God is pleased. Yes. So there's peace with us, but not all earth. I, I mean, what, what pleases God more than anything? You just said it, right? With us, why? Be, why? Why is he pleased with us? Because we, love we him. accept him as his gift. And we love him? He's our God. We've accepted, his, we've accepted, listen, it's not the gospel of men, it's the gospel of God. You know that, right? This is God's gospel, and you've accepted, you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. You believe this? You believe that he lived? You believe that he died? You believe that he was raised from the dead? You believe this, right? Do you believe that he's returning? Yes. Do you believe that you're going to be with him forever? Yes. And, and yet you don't have any proof of this at all, other than one place. Thank you. The only place that it's confirmed is in 
what you think and what you believe and what you know to be what? True. And that's why Paul could stand before kings and not be afraid and not be ashamed and not to cower and not to fall. The empowerment of the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. Absolutely. But his confidence in who? His confidence in the Lord, knowing that his life was already what? I'm already secure. What are you going to take from me? You cannot take anything from me. I get to live for ever. And I want you to come live with me. I want you to be with me where I'm going. And then if you look at the rest of that story, there's this point where, where he says, Paul, you would, you, would, you would convince me to be a Christian this day. And I'm, I'm all, look, and he said, and I'm almost at the point. Literally, when you read the scripture, that's literally what it means. Agrippa was this close to coming to the Lord. And then Paul says, not only as I am, I would want you to be, but anyone else who hears these words, except for one thing, these chains that bind me, that you would become just as I am. I wonder, did Agrippa come to the Lord? I wonder. I wonder. I wonder what he laid on his bed that night and thought about. I wonder. You don't know, do you? We like, sometimes, again, we like to think we know. How many other people were in that room and heard that and said, man, I need to come to the Lord? How many of them? Is that so almost... Decided, almost, almost persuaded. Persuaded. Yeah. persuaded. Almost persuaded. Almost persuaded. Well, don't be almost persuaded. Go all the way. All, all in or all out. Amen. Amen. That's probably the saddest song in every hymn. Almost persuaded. Almost persuaded. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you for the gifts that you have given to us in your son Jesus. Thank you so much for all that you've poured into us, that you approve of us, O oh Lord, as a product of believing you and knowing you. Give us the confidence that Paul had. Give us the experience that he had, Father, to be in absolute confidence of you and all that is of you. We pray for our lives, Lord God, again, that you would just infuse us so much with your life and the things of you that it simply overflows to anyone and everyone who comes in our life, Father God, that we could just impart that life and why and who it is that gives us that life. We continue to implore you and ask you for souls. We continue to implore you to open our eyes to the fields. We continue to ask you that you send more workers into your fields Again, Lord, call more into your kingdom and to fill your storehouse. Fill your kingdom, we would pray. We would ask you for this, Lord. Thank you for Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, our King, our Master, our God, our friend, our Savior. We, we're just so grateful to you for, again, what you have given to us. Help us to unwrap it more, Father, as you unwrap us and make us right. Bring us back to your design and what you want us to be. And just save a few more, Father. We would ask you for that. Save, save more. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said.
gift to you all comes down to what? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him would not perish but have ever everlasting life. And that's exactly what you have as a saint of God. You have everlasting life because of God's Amen. gift to you. Go ahead. It all comes down to you receiving it. Do you yes. receive it? Yes. The gift of God, do you receive his gift? Yes. Receive it. And then give it away. Amen. Receive it and give it away. Spread the word. Amen. Most gracious and heavenly Father, let your face shine upon us this day. Let your spirit be upon us, Father. Let your anointing message of your gospel rest upon us, Lord. As we go out in this world, take our feet, take our lives to where you would have them, Father. And impart your gospel message, your love, and your joy. Fill your kingdom, we would pray, O oh God. Fill it with souls and bring magn magnification to you and all that is of you, Father. We worship you. We worship you. We worship you. And again, Lord, we thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ, our Savior. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. 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 Hey, hug somebody.